Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is the Coloniality of Knowledge in Hegemonic Psychology, Part 2, Confronting Professional Discipline. I'm Sarah Mancall, the Policy Director for the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, also known as SPISI, and we are hosting a five-part webinar series this semester on decolonial perspectives. Before I hand things off to our convener and discussant, I want to thank the Reed Sura Decolonial Editorial Collective for organizing this series and editing the special issues of the Journal of Social Issues on which this series is based. And let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to SPISI's YouTube channel afterward. I will share this link and a number of other links in today's chat so that you can find everything you need afterward. And um, as well, the papers being discussed and a link for the fifth webinar in this series. And now I'm going to introduce our discussant for the, for the day, Shanaz Sufla from the University of South Africa, She's an associate professor and also a member of the Reed Sura Decolonial Editorial Collective. So Dr. Sofla, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and an enormous thank you to SPICI for hosting this webinar series on decolonial perspectives on the psychological study of social issues and for so, much, uh, so many other forms of support that uh, SPICI has provided to us. A very warm welcome to you all. Um, I'm speaking from Cape Town and um, uh, it is 6 p.m. here. Uh, really good to have you join us and we trust that you're going to find today's webinar as um, absorbing, as provocative and as instructive as the other ones have been. So this is the fourth in, a five -part web in, in the five-part webinar series that is being hosted by SPICI. Um, I really would like next to introduce the Ritsura Decolonial Editorial Collective. Before I do, I just want to add and with some amount of apology that I'm not going to be able to use my camera throughout this webinar, um, but I'm here and I am present. Um, so Gita, Gita um, ready? Hello, Gita, ready? Um, who is from the Open University in the UK, Glenn Adams, who is from the University of Kansas in the USA, and we might have lost Professor Kopano Ratele, who is from Stellenbosch University um, in South Africa. It really has been a pleasure working with the team over the last, what, two years or more. Uh, now, I know that from these pictures, um, Glenn Adams and I don't look as delighted to have been working for two years plus, but um, it has been a very meaningful experience. So uh, Reed Sura uh, colleagues, uh, great that you have been able to join today's webinar and um, thanks for the assistance that you're going to be providing in the background. So today I represent the editorial collective as the webinar convener and as the discussant. And I would like to begin with a brief description of the webinar series, especially for those of you who might not have been able to attend the preceding one. So the series features 15 presentations in all, and these have been organized in five installments. These presentations draw from or are based on the contributions to two special issues of the Journal of um, social issues, which have been devoted to decolonial perspectives in and on psychology. The first two installments, as you would see here, were hosted in September and in October, and were based on presentations that focus specifically on the psychology of colonial violence. Um, a recording of these webinars have, are available, and I'm sure at some point Sarah will uh, post the links to these recordings in the chat. The remaining three um, uh, 
uh, installments, including today's webinar, include presentations that talk very specifically to the coloniality of knowledge in hegemonic psychology. Collectively, these presentations problematize notions of innocence and neutrality um, and draw attention to epistemic violence in psychology, which, as you will hear from all the presenters, is inflicted in a myriad of ways, all of which, of course, associated with hegemonic psychology's modern colonial roots. And so these presentations very much bring to the foreground, and I might add very well, um, and I know this from, from the papers that you have all written, both conceptions and enactments that point to, for example, epistemic disruption, epistemic disobedience, resistance, refusal, um, within the discipline of psychology itself. You'll hear much more about this shortly. Today's meeting then, as I was saying earlier, is um, the fourth in our five-part webinar series, and it's organized very specifically around the theme confronting professional discipline. The three papers that are contained in this particular webinar highlight school psychology, professional psychology, community psychology's role in perpetuating coloniality and, and decolonial praxis, and offer us both unsettling as well as inspiring analytic accounts of really interesting, really thoughtful and inventive work that is being undertaken by our colleagues um, across different historical, uh, geographical and epistemological contexts. So I will stop sharing at this point um, and say that it's my pleasure, my absolute pleasure, to introduce the first group of presenters, and that is Stephanie Grant, Stephanie DaCosta, and Can Candace Anderson Amy, whose presentation is based on the contribution that they made to the special issue titled Decolonizing psychology research, a systematic literature review. They are presenting on behalf of their co-authors and their collaborators, who are Patrice Leverett, Stephanie Campbell, and Sydney Wynn. Over to you, colleagues. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, just getting set up here as I get to present her view. All right, thank you so much for uh, inviting us to speak today. So our project is Decolonizing School Psychology Research, a Systematic Literature Review. First and foremost, we want to share our positionality. So we come to you as a collective of minoritized women scholars who have joined together to find strength in community and joy in resistance. We want to acknowledge our situated situatedness, excuse me, in the American context as we all work and live in the United States. Um, as we continue continually try to dismantle colonialist ideologies and oppressive systems of our own training in our own context. Um, and so I am Stephanie Grant. I identify as Louisiana Creole, African American woman, cisgender, school psychologist, and assistant professor of psychology at Historically Black College, Xavier University of Louisiana. And I'll throw very quickly to my two co authors. So, uh, Dr. DaCosta. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie DaCosta. I'm a South Asian immigrant, cisgender woman. Um, I'm counseling faculty at St. Mary's College. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Candace Anderson Amy. I'm an African American cis woman from Indiana. I say that I reverse migrated to uh, Durham, North Carolina. Um, and I'm also a PhD candidate in curriculum and instruction at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Good to be here. And I will be starting off our presentation today. So we wanna situate ourselves in education right here. Schools represent one of the cornerstones of our societal structure in the United States. And with the potential of education that is um, touted as a liberating force and a point of access for marginalized groups, the reality is that schools serve as the primary reinforcers of Western, primarily Eurocentric logics 
norms, values, and oppressive doctrine. The school, the, excuse me, the discipline of school psychology has developed within this context where early tenants of the field were steeped in biased assumptions of the dominant culture in which schools are situated. So we wanna start with this statement. Schools have and continue to be sites of colonization. The social historical legacy of settler colonialism or the state by which a foreign entity literally settles on occupied land and sets out to dominate, govern, impose its own culture, places schools at the center of this project. And critical scholars of education and psychology have argued through that through the enforcement of compliance, of labeling, behavior management, and assessment, uh, schools have reproduced these settler traditions, values, beliefs, and ways of thinking over existing indigenous communities. And we only have to look back less than 50 years to see evidence 350 years of American Indian boarding schools and their legacies of epistemic and physical violence on indigenous communities. And uh, Stephanie, if you can go to the next slide. So this is a system of valuation and prescription that also disrupts Black, Latinx, Asian, and other minoritized and marginalized communities and their experiences in deeply harmful and culturally disidentifying ways. But schools are operating exactly how they were created to be. The system is not working, it's, it's working precisely as intended. And while we typically consider schools and their subsequent actors, the teachers and, and the subject of this presentation, school psychologists as helpers, and as part of these helping institutions, because most of us are coming to these institutions as that, the truth is that schools and its partner psychology have historically been inspired by 19th century social anxieties for the potentials of unintended children. And this resulted in the fixing problem children paradigm that can be seen in schools and psychology structures today. The next slide, please. So we don't ascribe to this paradigm, but we instead, our research attempts to decolonize as our um, quote points out here, seeking to remove the colonizer structure, language and ideologies. And from the way schools psychology research has culturally and analytically represented children. And in this way, I, I, we, we ask, how are we implicated in this, in this structure? So with this, I will turn it over to uh, DaCosta to, to bring us into the research. Yeah. So we start off with understanding a little bit about school psychologists and school psychology in general. As Candace mentioned, school psychology lands at the intersection of education and psychology, and so brings in some of the oppressive practices of both of those disciplines. Um, school psychologist is a subfield where we really think about how do we assess, intervene, and identify individuals who might need additional support within school settings. However, our discipline is always focused on identifying what is not normal from a medical model of psychopathology. And so othering has often been a key aspect of the discipline of school psychology. Next slide, please. So as we're thinking about school psychology and the ways in which it replica replicates oppression, we recognize that our field has inadvertently been tasked in targeting marginalized communities into the dominant narrative. We do this in three main ways. The first is this construct of labeling. We know historically and currently colonization has used labeling as a tool of domination and control of marginalized peoples. In schools, we as school psychologists use labeling and use definitions of what intelligence is, which is based in Eurocentric norms and values to determine who has a disability in our communities. School psychologists also embark on gatekeeping. We are often the individuals in a school building that make determinations about the placement of children within the school setting. And we do this based on determinations of the construct of intelligence. We place children based on their behavior and whether or not they're making adequate learning within the school structure. The last insidious way that school psychologists promote colonization is through practices that encourage compliance. 
So we teach the youth in our buildings through well-meaning programs of social emotional learning, um, mental health practices. We teach them to be compliant in the face of structural oppression. We often deny the valid and lived authentic experiences of harm that these youth face within schooling and within our structural context um, that originate in the school environment. We teach them to subdue those feelings into compliance so that they can continue to engage in the schooling process. Next slide, please. So school psychologists base a lot of our work in the foundation of research. Our constructs are designed to think about evidence-based practices. So how we determine what is evidence-based, we take this from the literature. And it, of course, we wanna recognize that research is based on empirical systems of knowledge that don't value and authenticate other ways of knowing and other ways of being. Next slide, please. So in reality, when we think about colonization within the research frame, we recognize that research has often been used as a tool to legitimize existing practices and assumptions of hierarchy and um, segregation. Specifically within the field of school psychology, um, our research practices have noted to discover ideas, specifically around notions of what it means to be intelligent and what intelligence and that construct is defined as. Thinking about what the construct of special education is and the services that students and families may receive, and ideas of disability. What does it look like to have a disability and what does it look like to um, remedy disability in children? So again, we want to center the fact that our research has been um, based on Eurocentric ideas of science and empiricism, and the assumption that what is valid and normal comes from a Eurocentric worldview and lens. And you can do the next slide. So I just want to state that these are some of the ways that our field has perpetuated the colonization of marginalized communities. The first is in the language that we use around closing the gaps between minoritized communities and white communities without really identifying the fact that there are structural and oppressive colonizational forces at play to influence this, these gaps that we're seeing. We also position ourselves as school psychologists as saviors of children in need. And again, this framework continues to enforce that legacy of colonization as saviors to the communities that they are encountering. We essentialize groups of communities, kind of putting all folks in continued buckets, as opposed to understanding the nuances and differences. We continue to hold deficit narratives of children and families that we work with. And lastly, we refuse to acknowledge the ways in which systems of oppression continue to perpetuate inequalities within schooling systems, um, and we continue to ignore these factors as we continue our work. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague here. All right, so uh, with that in mind, here is what our approach was to try to understand how this plays out in our field specifically. So uh, we did a systematic review. We reviewed articles in five journals for three years. Um, we had six coders, the six people that are part of our group. There were three faculty and three graduate students. And we looked specifically at some indicators that we thought might uh, highlight or outline the ways in which these colonists and Eurocentric ideas were playing out in the research, which is the core and the foundation of what we do. Uh, we looked at demographic group representation. So this was defined as whether or not a given minoritized population was reported in the sample of the study. Um, and further, we looked at subgroup analysis. So to what extent was any further analysis conducted for those identified groups? We also looked for evidence of deficit narratives. Um, so framing uh, marginalized groups as, uh, you know, some failing within them. So this is really common language in school psychology around things like closing the gap, right? Um, which sort of uh, puts the, the failures of the system and, and situates it in the individual, in the child and in the community, right? We also looked for acknowledgments of histories of oppression and the ways in which school psychology played a part in this uh, and school psychologists, as well as level of multicultural inclusion. So to what extent was there any degree of reflectiveness of um, the, the experiences of marginalized individuals beyond simple inclusion in the work? 
Okay, here were the uh, five journals we identified. Uh, we did identify these journals using the metric of impact factor, which we know is fraught and problematic as, as heck because it centers the voices of the powerful and continues to maintain those structures within the context of research. But we chose impact factor on purpose because we are trying to understand the ways in which systems of power continue to perpetuate narratives of whose voices get elevated and whose ideas get heard. Um, so this was uh, sort of intentionally selected. Uh, for that reason. And we wound up with uh, 627 articles that were coded by the team. So let's look at what we found. So here are the rates of minoritized inclusion um, that we looked at. Uh, we looked at a number of things, disability, immigration status, language status. Um, actually, one, I meant to start with um, Ethnic, ethnic group breakdown. Um, as we can see overall, there, there was a consistent trend across all of the minoritized or marginalized groups that we considered. Um, and I do want to fully acknowledge that these groups horribly collapsed extremely diverse groups into very simple categories, but these are the categories that we find most commonly in the journals that we uh, reviewed. And they represent Eurocentric and you know, weird norms about uh, group uh, organization, as it were, and, and the extent to which groups are sort of bucketed. Um, and so that reflected, that was reflected within um, our analysis as well, but we wanna acknowledge that it's deeply problematic. As you can see, the minoritized inclusion, so did we report that this group is present? Was was not as high as we'd want to see, certainly, but it it was much higher than any sort of analysis or deeper understanding of what might be happening specifically for those subgroups, right? So we get a lot of reporting, and this aligns with sort of what we see in our field right now, which is this acknowledgement of diversity as an issue, right, without any further uh, consideration or analysis of it. Okay. Let's go through a little bit more of our findings. First and foremost, we wanted to highlight that we also recorded the type of article, so quantitative analysis versus qualitative. And we can see 78% of articles represented quantitative research, i.e. numerical, empiricist, objective. Um, and we see a real de-emphasis of qualitative work, which again, uh, represents a very Eurocentric approach to science, right? What is valued, what is elevated, um, and what may not fully encompass or support um, the experiences or communicate the experiences of individuals uh, from minoritized and marginalized groups. We had less than 2% of articles acknowledge the role of school psychologists in maintaining structures of oppression. Um, less than 1.5% acknowledged histories of oppression at all. Uh, in relation to experiences of groups. About 7% of articles had essentializing language. So um, this is where we had both positive and negative representations of marg marginalized groups, which uh, sort of essentialized it down as if that was just a core aspect of them versus pejorative language, which was focused on deficit ideology, right? Where we saw weakness and illness and problemization and aggression, low educational level, um, related to identity. And finally, only 5% of articles considered any aspect of decolonizing critical race or culturally responsive frameworks. So despite the fact that 80% of articles included at least one of the marginalized or minoritized groups that we reported in our data set, right? Only 5% did any sort of critical analysis or critical work on this. So what does this mean? Um, or why is this important, right? Published literature and definitions of ev evidence-based practice influence everything we do. So we have biases in publication that impact our thinking about what works and why uh, the differences that we see exist at all. And so we need to consider for whom. So despite an emphasis on social justice in our field, researchers are not consider considering structures of oppression, but instead continuing to replicate historical oppression by maintaining assumptions about differences in groups. And I think a key idea here is we are influenced by the past and the colonial present. 
Sorry, Stephanie, oh, you, have, yes. you have less than a minute left. Thank you. Sure. Um, briefly, we also identified some, I, some things that we thought would um, perhaps help us move forward in the field, such as expanding our methodology, utilizing quant crit, crit, crit approaches if we're going to do quantitative work, diversifying journal editors, um, and avoiding deficit tropes in our field. So with that, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm really sorry that I had to rush you along. So colleagues, please let's drop comments in the chat to express our appreciation for this excellent presentation. Thank you again, Stephanie, Stephanie and Candice. Next, we will move to Hugo Cannon, who will present on behalf of his co-authors and collaborators, and I shall name them, Brett Bowman, Tanya Graham, Garth Stevens, Malosi Langa, Benita Jitu, and Deline Alexander. And the title of Prof. Cannon's presentation is Conundrums in Teaching Decolonial Critical Community Psychology Within the Context of Neoliberal Market Pressures. Thanks, Hugo, and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Shanaz. Uh, thank you to uh, my colleagues and to those of you who've attended uh, today. Um, so Shanaz has mentioned the co-authors of the paper um, on whose behalf I'm, I'm talking about it. Um, in the background, you'll see a slideshow, which in some ways has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, um, but it's to give context about the place where I'm located and the students and the world to which students go after they complete their studies. Um, so in the early 2000s, my department uh, started the community-based psychology program. Um, the program sought to center community in psychology. And this was a departure from traditional professional programs However, since students are primed for professional registration with the Health Professions Council, um, which is the re regulatory body, um, and university programs require maximum enrollment numbers, we tethered community to counseling psychology. Um, the paper that I'm talking about is, a, is the consequence of my and my colleagues attempt to understand if our community psychology graduates, um, you know, are having any uh, trac political traction in employment and practice trajectories um, where they are after they, they exit. Briefly stated, our program allows students to exit at the master's level with a uh, qualification that we call masters in community-based counseling psychology, and, and it enables them to register with the Health Professionals Council as communities, as, sorry, as counseling psychologists. Um, registration with the regulatory body entitles members to claim for therapeutic services from health insurance uh, benefits of clients uh, with health insurance or medical aid in our context. Um, we train students to respond to two imperatives, to have the skills required by the Health Professionals Council to practice as therapists and to be able to undertake interventions in community contexts beyond the therapeutic encounter. The latter is based on traditional community psychology principles together with emergent decolonial theorization that interrogates issues of geo and body politics, the nature of psychological knowledge, conceptions of well-being, and a critical interrogation of histories and community in this context. For us, decolonizing means an unwavering um, commitment to an untangling knowledge production from a Eurocentric episteme and recentering local knowledges and ways of knowing uh, in order to account, to, to mount a radical change in our majority world conditions 
of marginalization, inequality, and de discrimination. These are all manifestations of the contemporary legacy of coloniality. However, within the constraints of a disciplinary location anchored to the Psi complex, we see the bifurcation as a challenge and an opportunity to both feed into and to fugitively undercut the Psi complex. We aim for our students to hold the conceptual tensions that this bifurcated lens generates in order for them, in order to give them options to intervene in multiple contexts uh, as community workers and as therapists. Um, so I'll, I'll skip through the method and just and just kind of go to, to what we found. Um, we found that neoliberal market pressures, this was you know, in doing a tracer study with alumni. Uh, we found that neoliberal market pressures were powerful determinants of the kinds of practice alumni were engaged in. The ability to claim from medical insurance was the most stable form of income for them. This had the effect of channeling alumni into psychotherapy as a primary form of intervention. They, com they complained that community work was underfunded, lacked the structure and predetermined relational uh, coordinates provided by the therapeutic encounter where everybody knows their place. And in precarious economic times with donors withdraw support, community work is difficult to do. We however found that critical and decolonial elements of our training were not totally wasted. Alumni claimed to use the critical consciousness engendered through their training in therapeutic practice. In particular, it, it was useful to make meaning of the context as well as identity um, uh, dynamics in, in the South African context and uh, against the background uh, drop of its history. In addition, some of them were employed as psychologists in institutional settings like prisons where their mandate was to work with marginalized communities. Others used funds from private practice to support more financially precarious community practice, like preventative projects on gender-based violence or working with homeless communities in partnership with local government and community-based NGOs. Some sticking points then uh, to, to just quickly unpack in relation to professional psychology, uh, decolonial practice and professional psychology. Decolonial practice uh, is inherently contradictory uh, because in practice, total liberation is not possible as it has to contend with intractable demands of the present neoliberal order and pool and the pool of the side complex and regulatory mechanisms. Um, decoloniality's emergent traction within the academy is not mirrored within the world of professional psychological practice. In reality, there is little conceptual space to simultaneously hold identities of social, just, of, of social justice community workers um, with those of clinical practice. Consequently, alumni who have consciously engaged in everyday modes of market resistance in, in forms of decolonial work and activism uh, must almost wholly disidentify as professional psychologists in order to actively pursue change agendas because holding the two identities um, is, is difficult in practice. You either a community worker or you a therapist. So uh, alumni uh, must walk the precipice of the disconnect, the contradictions between the decolonial promises of the program, as well as on the other hand, the neoliberal market pressures that continue to commodify psychology and its privileged forms of individualized uh, psychotherapeutic intervention, a practice site predominantly selected by many of our alumni. The implications of our 
findings suggest that scholars, educators, practitioners, and policymakers should contemplate what it means to work from a place of contradiction and complexity, where uh, we are prehending psychology as both an object of our critical gaze because of its disciplinary decay as a knowledge complex, as well as a site for socially transformative potential. In inhabiting the spirit of experimentation and decolonial imaginings, there is room, we argue, to consider what possibilities of a decolonial community psychology may look like if it had to sever its relations to regulating professional bodies and the politics of private healthcare and what it would mean for community psychology to be free of these neoliberal trappings, which um, cater to a limited uh, pool of the population. You'll see in the slides that there are massive social challenges and we can only skirt about the margins if we uh, attach our thinking and our practice to the psych complex. We are challenged to consider if we can decolonize without de-psychologizing the field of community psychology. Um, I'm hoping that more may be illuminated in, in the discussion, um, but I'm going to stop here. Uh, and, and perhaps, Shanaz, if I have a minute um, you to do say that. Go okay, ahead. Thank you. Yeah. To, to say that part of, of what the slide show uh, is illustrating are the mirrored social challenges that, that we are faced with. Um, and I've just presented some statistics on crime, or a snapshot for a, a three month period last year um, in a very specific community, um, and as well as the unemployment figures uh, that are for the youth are as high, and, and by youth, I'm talking about out of school to about 35, as high in some areas as 75%. And what this means for where uh, paid for care um, can reach, as well as um, the rampant inequality in, in South Africa, um, where we have the highest uh, levels of inequality according to the, um, the word escapes me, but the, yes, that, that, that frame. Uh, so, so it's against this backdrop that we set to think about the possibilities that our students can make in the world. And we are in some ways in this paper lamenting some of the failures and the limitations of what can be done. Um, thank you, Shana, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Hugo. Um, colleagues, again, please join me in expressing appreciation for another outstanding presentation. Um, and finally, we turn to the contribution by Janelle Silva, Jessica Fernandez, and Angela Nguyen, titled, And Now We Resist, Three Testimonials on the Importance of Decoloniality Within Psychology. Um, again, Jessica will present on behalf of her co-authors, and I'm sure uh, what you will refer to as your accomplices, Jessica. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Shanas, for, for that introduction and, and to my fellow panelists for your presence and, and um, everyone who's joining us near and far. I'm going to go ahead and transition into sharing my screen um, and we'll, we'll go ahead and, and begin. So I'm honored really to, to share and hold space um, with so many of you across time zones and locations. I join you from a land that rightfully belongs to the Ohlone and Wekmoloni people where I am an uninvited occupant working to decolonize my ways of knowing and being within and beyond the academy. And one of the ways in which um, I pursue this ongoing decolonial practice and process is through my relationships and embodiments. And today I'm, I'm grateful to the organizers of the special issue and the webinar who have provided us with the space to reflect on these themes and links um, as they relate to this co-authored publication 
that I had the privilege and joy of co-writing and co-creating with my comrades and accomplices, Drs. Janelle Silva and Angela Wen, who are unable to join me, but whose presence is greatly felt. Um, so in what follows, I'm gonna highlight a few themes from our article with the intention to have us reflect really deeply on the coloniality of knowledge and how we can confront, refuse, and disentangle ourselves from the disciplinary regimes that are so characteristic of psychology. And so I remain open to your thoughts um, as I share some reflections and as they also resonate and tie in with um, some of the uh, insights and reflections that my fellow co-panelists have shared today. And this presentation in particular focuses more of the personal and relational journeys of decolonization and disruption. In writing our piece, we reflected upon the tensions and contradictions of embracing decoloniality within and outside psychology. Janelle, Angela, and I are trained as social community psychologists, yet we are all differentially positioned. Janelle is in an interdisciplinary school of arts and sciences. Angela is not in a university, instead she is a community advocate. And I am in an ethnic studies department moving between community and university. We are outside of psychology, yet we are within it, implicated in some form in the colonial projects reflected in the discipline and in the academy. So our paper is anchored in a decolonial feminist framework where we approach decoloniality through reflection, dialogue, action, and communal conocimiento as a purposeful act of delinking knowledge and practice away from oppressive systems, relationships, and epistemologies of hegemonic power. We understand decoloniality as a practice and a process and also a pedagogy. It is active and purposeful and oriented towards transformative justice and in alignment with Tuck and Yang's note on the importance of approaching decoloniality through action, not as a metaphor or as a substitute for other words, but rather decolonization as a deep understanding, critical understanding of oneself others and the ways of being that are attentive to the modalities of power that grow out of colonial relationships and standpoints and that often remain unquestioned and unseen. The process of critical reflexivity that we featured in this article involved us attending to the embodiments and enactments of coloniality in how and what we teach and relatedly how we approach research the questions we ask and why we ask these questions all matter for these hold the potential to reproduce colonial dynamics if we are not attentive to the ways that colonialism assembles itself, thereby outliving coloniality. And as several scholars have noted, coloniality is and remains long before colonization, and it is marked by the enduring and longstanding patterns of power and imperialism built upon the exploitation of people, lands, and resources. Embodying a decolonial feminist praxis requires being critically reflexive, walking while asking, and asking as we walk, and doing so not in solitude, but in mutual accompaniment, as Drs. Duta, Atala, and collaborators also featured in the special issue describe as constellations of co-resistance anchored in decolonial love. So reflecting on our testimonials and our relational experiences and positionalities, we were guided in writing this piece through the following questions. How do we resist forces of coloniality and colonialism in our work? And how do our positionalities and identities inform our approach to epistemic decoloniality and decolonization? So together, the three of us testimoniamos our academic trajectories in relation to a decolonial feminist praxis and pedagogy that is very much tethered to who we are and what we do and our pursuits and intentions. We approach these questions through a decolonial methodology of testimonio, which is a process, practice, and a method that is anchored in Latin American and Latinx critical feminist epistemologies and strategies of sociopolitical resistance and dissent, as well as movement building and affirmation and healing. Writings by Gloria Anzaldúa, Sherry Moraga, Chela Sandoval, Emma Perez, 
among other third world feminist scholars, as reflected in the anthology, This Bridge Called My Back, demonstrate the power of the written word in testimonial form when done in community, accompaniment, and in solidarity with others whose struggles or experiences, while unique and distinct from one's own, can nevertheless serve as a bridge to bring forward possibilities of coalitional resistance, reciprocal humanizing recognitions, and communities of rebellion that move beyond identity politics and hierarchies of oppression. Inspired by Anzaldúa's writings, specifically her chapter on the process of developing conocimiento or deep critical consciousness with commitment, testimoniamos our shared stories, reflections, and vignettes of our past and our present. We co-created a relational methodology of testimonio to engage autoteoría or auto theory as a decolonial feminist method to resist molding ourselves into the hegemonic Eurocentric canon of US-based psychology. We co-reflected upon our research and pedagogy and we engaged testimonio to make visible our theory of the flesh, our stories written and transcribed to produce, sustain, cultivate, heal, and also bridge ourselves and our dissident subjectivities as transdisciplinary women of color scholars. Testimonio for us is a paradigmatic methodological and pedagogical tool and an embodiment of critical reflexivity that is ongoing, relational, and iterative that interrogates what decoloniality is and does in relationship to our teaching, research, and practice. And in what follows, I am going to highlight three testimonial excerpts that demonstrate our critical reflexive dialogue journey towards the embodiment of a decolonial pedagogical praxis as teacher, scholars, and comrades. This first testimonio is by Janelle. And um, in the interest of time, I will not read the entire thing, but I invite you to connect and read through this on your own. However, I will highlight some key themes from each of our testimonios. Before I share my testimonio, I want to first introduce you, the reader, to how these stories originated. We were all graduates of the social psychology PhD program at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Although all three of us did not overlap in our education, we did have similar experiences in terms of academic training, faculty interactions, and a shared lab space. Academic conferences provided us the opportunity to come together as an academic family where we grew our intellectual connections through conference presentations and our personal relationships. Speaking from our experiences as educators, scholars, and community practitioners, we offer these testimonials as examples of how we have each wrestled with decolonizing psychology. Each testimonio speaks to how we have individually dealt with our experiences as community psychologists, both inside the classroom and in the field. Speaking from my standpoint, Janelle writes, as an educator, I discuss how I integrate a decolonial praxis pedagogy within my classroom, reflecting on how my educational training and intersecting identities developed my pedagogy in the unexpected outcomes for students and our institution. My testimonial begins our shared journey of what it means to decolonize psychology. Writing and reflecting in relationship with Janelle, I offered the following testimony. In reflecting upon Janelle's testimony, I cannot overlook the fact that I was once her student. I sat as an undergraduate student in a class that she TA'd and for the first time saw myself in what I was learning. The activities, questions, and stories that Janelle shared with me were pivotal to my col colonial undoing and my path towards conocimiento, a decolonial praxis. I began to embrace my place in higher education because Janelle helped cultivate a space to make my lived experiences, voice and curiosity surface in a way no other educator had done so while pursuing my undergraduate studies. The stories and experiences Janelle shared, which rendered her testimonio as a Chicana PhD, 
were affirming and led me to radically imagine possibilities for me as a first generation college student. These are the memories that have forged themselves into a decolonial praxis pedagogy, which I reflect upon and describe through my testimonials. Now that I am a faculty member, I hope to inspire and cultivate the decolonial imaginings that Janelle once did for me. Our testimonials are threaded through these decolonial encounters in the classroom that eventually find their way out into the field, into communities and projects that as Angela's testimonial will demonstrate, challenge Western Eurocentric modes of thought that render our communities and experiences illegible. We accompany and witness each other's journey within and beyond the PhD as we listen and live our testimonials. And finally, the third and last testimonial excerpt that I will share is by Angela. And she writes, Jessica's testimonial on decolonial pedagogy contextualizes her approach to cultivating student-centered research projects, which Janelle's testimonial clearly illustrates through the development of the Praxis project. Both testimonials demonstrate the value of a decolonial pedagogy, as well as putting knowledge into action. Both Janelle and Jessica's testimonials speak to how our identities shape our pedagogy and practice. I have personally borne witness to Jessica's decolonial praxis as an invited guest speaker in her classrooms. Asked to present on how I engage in decoloniality within my work, this was more than an invitation to visit, but rather an opportunity to disrupt the narrative that research is subjective, depersonalized, and devoid of experience. As a community-based researcher, Having collaborated with Jessica, Angela writes, I reject leaving unquestioned Western Eurocentric paradigms and discourses that render some communities invisible, voiceless, and illegible. Employing decolonial praxis, like the approach that Jessica cultivates among her students, I engage in research inquiry, first through my experiences, positionalities, and conditions that impact my communities. My research aims to interrogate and question coloniality by resisting dominant ways of thinking and instead shifting to a decolonial research praxis. In sharing these testimonials, I draw attention to the interconnectedness of experiences and embodied subjectivities. This visual illustrates some of the themes that thread together our testimonials with our pedagogy and praxis. In particular, how decoloniality is a practical pedagogy, a pedagogy that is lived, embodied, enacted, and relational, and carried forward in communality. The first theme is that decolonial practical pedagogy must be critically reflexive, intersectional, and relationally attentive to the systems and inner workings of power, and how these shape positionality, subjectivities, and sociopolitical consciousness and interdependent modes of agency and collective action. The second theme highlights the importance of censoring experiential, local and communal collective relational forms of knowledge, as well as modes of knowing that are unrecognized, devalued or illegible, as Angela's testimonials make visible of how subaltern subjects with a sociopolitical awareness may themselves often reproduce colonial harms or wounding when the political subjectivity is dehistoricized from the material, symbolic, and intergenerational conditions of violence. The third and fourth themes, while distinct, are interconnected. Engaging transdisciplinary perspectives and orientations as my testimonials of integrating ethnic studies in community-based research courses demonstrate, we must not reproduce disciplinary regimes that rather than support community well-being, serve to compartmentalize and fragment some of their experiences under a scientific objective colonial gaze. Thus, in troubling these binaries and the dialectical uh, relationships between the university and the community, textbook knowledge versus lived and embodied and experiential relational knowledge and realities, Janelle's testimonial offers examples of what it means to decolonize the classroom and how that has implications for anti-colonial organizing, movement building and activism within the university. And so in this way, our shared testimonials strive towards the actualizing of the third university. Reflecting on the writings by the Paperson, 
we exist in a colonial and colonizing university that is simultaneously brewing and birthing decolonial actors, a place where the rematriation of land, the regeneration of relationships, and the forwarding of indigenous, black, queer, and feminist futures is possible, where effective decolonial action involves the restoration of futures alongside the crafting of new abolitionist visions and possibilities that refuse to be complicit in projects of domination and erasure. In closing, I want to offer us an invitation towards deeper relational reflexive engagement and dialogue. It is my intention that our humble testimonios as women of color can help affirm those who are feeling siloed or seared by the blades of coloniality within the academy. We asked ourselves while writing this piece and still to this day and continuously, how can we co-create and hold and share space for decolonial pedagogical proxies that challenge our own disciplining and the disciplinary regimes that sustain colonial formations? Anchored in a decolonial feminist praxis, I invite us to reflect on these themes and what Dr. Deanne Bell urges us to do, which is to occupy the classroom radically by decolonizing and transforming spaces towards more expansive, critical, anti-colonial, abolitionist, and liberatory relationships and pathways for and of knowing and being. Testimoniamos how we made and continue to make space for the unfolding of decolonization via relationships of community care, refusal, and rebellion. And in closing, I want to end with the words of Dr. Lorgia Garcia Peña. Community is something we practice rather than what we are a part of. Community as rebellion are the spaces of freedom making, of feeling, and of nurturance, and of transgressing the boundaries of our disciplining disciplines and institutions. Our testimonios demonstrate our process of resisting the coloniality of power as neoliberalized, neocolonized technologies that constrain our militant dreams of desire and revolution recognition and affirmation. We must forge communal and community pathways forward towards decolonial epistemologies. And testimonial is one bridge, a decolonial pedagogical praxis towards that path. And thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now and um, transition into the next phase of our session. Thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, once more, let's go to the chat and express our appreciation for the exceptional work being done by Jessica, Janelle, and Angela. Uh, my Reflora colleagues, my internet connection is extremely unstable, so if I do drop out, I will rely on you to step in for me. Thank you very much. Um, this then brings us to the part of the webinar where I take some space to offer brief comments, and more importantly, to open up space for engagement between the presenters and the audience, so the Q&A part of the webinar. And my Ritsura colleagues will assist me in curating the questions addressed to the presenters. I see Glenn has um, asked that you please use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform to pose your question. Um, so my comments are referenced against the presentations themselves as well as the larger project on decolonial perspectives on the psychological study of social, is social issues. As we have stated elsewhere, the overall special issue work has much to do with longstanding concerns, certainly here in South Africa, and new forms of self-reflection about the need to decolonize psychology. So very much to turn the analytic lens back on hegemonic knowledge to create versions of research, scholarship, teaching, training, and practice delinked, um, to reference Maniolo, from the Eurocentric modern heritage of hegemonic global psychology, and that better resonate with the concerns, ways of life, everyday realities, and aspirations of the global majority. Have, have, am I lost? Sarah, can you hear me? Thank you. Specifically, today's presentations are based on or draw from a special issue collection of articles that consider psychology as a site for decolonial analysis. Accordingly, they all implicate 
um, in different ways, epistemic violence in hegemonic psychology, and in different ways point to the kinds of interventions that are thus implied. Epistemic violence, as we indicate in, in our introduction to the special issue, is very much a matter of epistemic exclusion of racialized others from the knowledge production process, what we refer to as imperialist imposition of whitewashed knowledge products as very much universal standards without due regard to context or pathologizing forms of explanation that construct racial others as deviants in light of whitewashed standards. In addition, we reference epistemic violence in psychology to forms of harm associated with its modern um, colonial roots. And so we talk about intellectual imperialism, um, epistemological violence, coloniality of knowledge, all of which we have heard our colleagues talk to today, uh, one manifestation of which is um, zero point epistemology or what Mignola uh, refers to um, um, as or what it talks to is the idea of us um, uh, being located as so-called neutral observers whose uh, individuals' abstractions from context then allow us to take rather objective and detached standpoints on the work that we do. And so the presentations today, which are aligned, of course, with the larger special issue work to which I have made, made some um, minor reference, assume a decolonial epistemic orientation and Southern and feminist standpoints towards illuminating how prevailing articulations of hegemonic psychology reproduce epistemic violence. And as much, they help us to imagine or to reimagine what alternatives are possible or not actually, or not for that matter. What would it look like to decologize uh, the discipline. Is this possible? Um, there are many questions that I think are, are provoked by their presentation. Our colleagues apply critical tools of decolonial analysis to the questions and provocations that they pose, and ultimately their work contributes to forms of psychological study beyond disciplinary fidelity that are obviously suitable for decolonial work, including knowledge production, of course. And an important facet of this work, as all the presenters reflect, is the inherent messiness, um, complexities, the disconnects and the contradictions that remain and must necessarily be recognized even as, as we strive to enact decolonial imaginaries, what um, uh, Grant and colleagues refer to as moving beyond what is comfortable. With this, I will remark briefly on two cent central themes that stand out, uh, on which today's presentations place the accent, confronting professional discipline, of course, and the exciting work by our colleagues illuminate and confront forms of professional discipline, discipline rooted in white supremacist and colonial logic and institutional and systemic structures that very much enforce conformity to prescriptive standards that replicate oppressive philosophies, that promote and reward submission to the coloniality of knowledge and being, that moderate forms of dissent and resistance, and extend and breed what Hugo Canham and his co-authors note as iniquitous forms of material, material, materiality. So the authors call for forms of delinking from dominant modes of psychological practice and transcending the, the methods and the borders of the discipline itself. Uh, this echoes very strongly with many of us doing this work. And so I, and I imagine many others would be most interested to hear from you how you were doing this in your own work with students and other collectives with, within and beyond classrooms and university corridors. Um, how it is that you do this work of transcending. The second theme we note, of course, is that of cultivating refusal, resistance, and epistemic uh, disobedience as fundamental to ways of knowing and being. 
Of course, this is central to the contribution um, by Jessica and her colleagues, as we've just heard, on engaging decolonial decoloniality in the praxis and pedagogy of community psychology. And also I will add that this theme extends very much into the final webinar, which is to follow next month. Again, the work of all the presenters is exciting um, in that it steadfastly refuses to accept the constraints of the discipline and moves beyond the limits and boundaries of psychology and knowledge production processes in the discipline. So. But by this, we mean methodological fundamentalism and zero point epistemology of hegemonic psychology to engage from standpoints, like I said earlier, everyday realities and with requisite epistemic resources and experiences that are very much explicitly place based, positionality cognizant, and identity conscious, in contrast to the kinds of radical abstractions from context that all the um, uh, presenters have critiqued. In turn, I would be very interested in how you all navigate the, the limits of refusal and resistance of epistemic disobedience and resisting the, um, the discipline itself. So let me end by saying, well, by thanking you all for your bold and imaginative work in limiting and counteracting uh, epistemic violence in psychology, the ways in which you honor decolonial praxis, um, especially as we see how more and more the language of decoloniality is being appropriated and bastardized, and for contributing to the conversation on refusal of the discipline of psychology itself. Thank you very much. I would invite you then to turn to the comments. I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, nope. Yeah, have I missed anything, Glenn? No, no, you haven't missed anything. But I think you posed a couple very uh, interesting questions for people. If you don't mind uh, repeating what you said you had, would like to hear, I think that's a good place to start. Um, do you, so I missed that. Are you asking me to repeat? Uh, yeah, yes? no, you had mentioned oh. you had mentioned a couple of things that you thought would be very yes. interesting to All hear. Right. Maybe, maybe right. the authors have heard it already and they can respond, but I thought it might be good to pull them out again as our first question. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Maybe just to say very quickly again, um, I was saying that I would be interested in how you all navigate the limits of refusal, resistance, epi epistemic disobedience. Um, and then, of course, in talking about um, uh, how you confront professional discipline. Um, I'm very interested to hear from you how you are doing the doing your work with students and with other collectives within and beyond classrooms and university corridors when we talk about delinking, when we talk about transcending the borders of the discipline. Um, so you have, of course, shared some of that with us, some of you have, but I'd really be interested to hearing more about, uh, about your work in this respect. Um, so, of course, these are just one or two questions, but you might want to add or elaborate on some of what you've already shared with us. And, um, yeah, there might be some comments as well that you would want to engage with. Um, so over to you. Um, anyone want to have a go first? Stephanie, you look like you want to say something. No? I, sure, sure. Uh, navigating the, lip, the limits of refusal, I think, is something I think about a lot and we talk about a lot in our collective community that we work in of uh, women of color. Um, my for me specifically, how I've navigated this is I've found communities of protection. So in the US context, uh, minority serving institutions and historically black colleges tend to be protective, a little bit more protective. And so we're able to speak a little more and take a larger step than maybe folks who aren't in those contexts. Um, and we we write about this in the paper, didn't really have time to talk about it in the in the presentation. The way that I navigate this in my field, because what's valued and what's published in my journals that I'm pre-tenure, right? I'm still going for tenure, is um, 
I take a quant crit approach. So I'm a, I'm a like kind of a stats person, to be honest, more so than the rest of my team. And I know Qual is much more decolonial, right? And I'm trying, I'm always trying to learn. We joke about it all the time on the team. You see Candace smiling about my, my journey <laughs> with Qual because um, I wasn't trained in it at all. And so the way that I take that approach is there is power in numbers. You know, I think about things like board, Brown v. Board and stuff like that. Some of that research that helps us move the needle on equity, right? uses data, uses numbers. And so I I take my place of power, which is my stats expertise and use that to try to push the needle. And that's that balance where I'm still playing their game a little bit, to be honest, but, but pushing it as much as I can from a philosophical perspective. So that's just some thoughts on that, I guess. Hmm. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, did anyone else want to chime in on this? I think we're following the order of presentation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, so it, thanks, Janaz. Thanks, it, it is a difficult one because, you know, um, the, the mode that we can all into is, is one of critique um, that does not offer the so what uh, appended to that. Um, so just a, a, a bite at this, for me, interdisciplinarity, that where I, I try to think outside of psychology um, as, a, as a mode of, of refusing its terms of reference um, is I, I found very generative. And, you know, and it, it makes one humble too, to, to learn anew and to see anew. Um, so, so much of my scholarly work at the moment is in this mode of refusal and, and finding really generative ways of thinking about the same issues but from another vantage point that I lean on, on other disciplines um, is, is, is one example. Um, so, I mean, I think the theorization that comes from fields like black studies or African studies are really useful in centering the people with whom you are in dialogue thinking with and and communing and struggling with. Um, so, you know, with, with students, our projects have, have really tried to, it's, uh, to, to move away. So on the, on the community pracs to, to move away entirely from therapeutic, um, lagers or encounters, because as soon as they appear, the graduate students, people immediately bring uh, potential clients and problems to them. And the art of refusing that, even though they are trained in that modality too, um, and if, you know, making sandwiches is what is important on the day at the place uh, of the prep work, then that's what you know, is done collectively. Um, so if it's homelessness, what, what do homeless people need and, and want, which is often more urgent than uh, psychotherapy? Um, so so it, it's very difficult because it's almost like tying someone's hands behind their back because they, they primed for engaging that way. Uh, but expanding our forms of relationality through through those modes is useful, and I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, and thanks, thanks Jessica. Sorry, I interrupted you. You were about to to respond. Thank you. I was going to resonate with what both Stephanie and and Ugo shared regarding the importance of fostering and building and co-creating community spaces of care. Um, what um, Garcia Peña describes as communities of rebellion and resistance and refusal. 
um, and also what Ugo shared regarding transdisciplinarity. I would say that um, that is one key aspect of the ways in which I engage in refusal and, and dissent, sort of blurring the lines of my disciplinary training, um, where, I, where I publish, how I publish, how I write, um, the courses I teach. Uh, I am in a unique uh, situation where I am in an ethnic studies department that has allowed me the capacity to be everything and nothing. <laughs> Um, even though I am trained as a social community psychologist, but it has really allowed me the freedom and flexibility to just be and transgress those boundaries. In addition to what my co-panelists shared, I will also add that um, another uh, one of the ways in which I navigate the limits of, of refusal is um, and something that my students have helped me come to understand and recognize is that crit critique is, is important, decolonization is necessary. And so is the, the co-creation and imagination and radical hope and abolitionist vision of another wise. And so for, for, for me, for us in, in community collaborations in the classroom, it's also important to, to dream, to envision, uh, what could be, and to, in some cases, um, go back to, to histories to see where, where we've been, what has been resisted and um, transformed and transgressed to learn from that and imagine what, what could be, um, especially in terms of thinking about um, some of the major liberation and civil rights movements of the 60s that really brought together these multiracial, multi-ethnic coalitions that right now um, some people are, are seeing as something that cannot be achieved because here in the US context, there's so much uh, political tension and division of us versus them and identity politics. And so returning to that history to then pull from that and reimagine and co-create um, is probably one of one of the practices and strategies um, that I use both in my research, teaching and practice. So Shanaz has informed me that uh, she's, um, she's, her connection is dropping. So I'm going to, to take over um, leading the discussion for a moment or facilitating the discussion. Um, I think that the papers and the discussion, especially the, the discussion goes beyond the papers even and does a really good job of uh, pulling out some interesting points. So I, I definitely want to express my appreciation for the work that the presenters have done today. And uh, in addition to the work that they had done in the first place. And um, I, I like the discussion of uh, sort of thinking through the, the question of discipline, uh, both the kind of as a synonym for field of knowledge production, but then getting in the idea that it does come with force, with normative force and prescriptive force that uh, tries to, to do particular things. And I, I was wondering, uh, there's an idea that sort of runs through all the presentations that, I, that if you could, I'd like to hear more about. And that is this idea of that in order to decolonize psychology, you might have to to, um, to, to de-psychologize psychology. And um, this is especially interesting, I think, for the for SPICI, the organization, the division of psychology of the American Psychological Association that's hosting this webinar. Uh, the name of the field this is a Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. I think it emerged, its history is positioning itself as an interdisciplinary space. So a lot of people who contributed to the field, especially in earlier days, but even up to today, tend to be sort of outside the discipline of psychology. But then it has that, that kind of phrase, the psychological study. And I just wonder what the psychological study is, what that means to say we have psychological study and um, what, what of that is, it, do what, what would we consider or I consider you consider uh, problematic? But then also what is it that, uh, that psychological study, if not the discipline of psychology, what is it that we think is valuable? We all come to 
that set of things uh, and we're here and we, we're somehow affiliated with it, how, what, would you, what do we see as um, useful potentially for this project? What do you see as useful and, and how, what is the sense in which we need to psychologize? I'll start super briefly if we're going to go in the order we presented. Um, we had we had this conversation in our collective as we were writing this paper, and a lot several people were just like, "I don't know that school psychology exists." If we fully decolon, like literally the entire discipline of school psychology, like our whole role has been labeling and normalize, you know, and 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 fixing folks when it's not the folks, it's the system right when you get down to understanding it in a little bit more complexity and i that's something i've been struggling with if someone wants to write a paper about it i can't wait to read it what remains like literally name it what remains <laughs> like i don't know right um because i mean apa just published a uh, um a bunch of of stuff about the ways in which this whole thing comes from eugenicist approaches, like the whole idea of psych from the core, from the beginning. So what is left? I, please colleagues, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> so I, so there's value to, to psychology, but it's a particular kind of value. Um, and in context of great inequality, what it offers is very limited and ameliorative. Uh, it, 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 it cannot um, stand up to the task that is required. Um, so I think the study of psychology as you're articulating it is possibly a critique of it because it is so powerful, you know, as Ian Parker writes about the psych complex, it, in my context, attracts uh, the highest numbers of undergrad students all lined up, and the funnel only gets smaller and they won't all make it into graduate studies. Um, but they are enamored with this idea of, of the brain, of the mind and the psyche. Um, and, and so much work goes into propping this up right uh every sitcom soapy movie has has some really uh, redeeming portrayal of psychology and the need for it everyone is told about this urgent great need um, for psychological practice so i think this, uh, this psychological study and how you're articulating it is is in, is it possibly a, a counter to this? And the decolonial lens is particularly important for framing and imagining, as, as uh, Jessica was saying, what is possible. And it's, it's hard to imagine what's possible. So collectively doing this um, is, is, is important. Um, and I think that's a big enough task on its own. Yeah. Thank you so much for this very um, thought provoking and mind stretching question, Gwen, <laughs> because it's one that I often ask myself um, when when students ask what was my 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 background or my my training, and I say, "Oh, I'm psychology," and they're just confused what am I doing <laughs> um, but for me it's become very important to to the question of the psychological study of social for me has been really important um, to study the psychology of psychology in the U.S. and to look to its history and formation particularly community psychology in the U.S. Um, to look at that history critically to try to understand its roots and and its routes and um, what other movements and forms of grounded grassroots community psychologies if if i think of psychology as as the relationship between 
thought and action and relationality and environment, person, place, and all of these dynamics, you know, social psychology 101, then, then psychology becomes some much more expansive, much more inclusive and accessible. And I can sort of work and move with that psychology. And so I, I take that perspective, that sort of epistemological lens to understand the psychology of psychology, where I am located, and then and then seeing and, and putting it sort of in, in conversation with the forms of psychology and really resistant critical liberation psychologies that were happening alongside US community psychology in, in Latin America, um, that much more um, align with the work and praxis that I do here in the US context, predominantly with Latinx communities. Um, and and as, a, as, a, as, a, as a Latina myself. And so it's, it's important for me to kind of thread those things together um, doing a simultaneous dance of delinking and troubling and unsettling at, at the same time as sort of we're sort of imagining and dreaming up possibilities and um, trying new things and being experimenting um, and making a lot of um, mistakes and you know growing pains along along the way kind of in the ways that, that Ugo was describing where, where you sometimes have to kind of put yourself, not say that you are trained as a psychologist and kind of remove some of the layers and, you know, hats and trainings um, and untrainings that we, that I've experienced. Um, I hope that offers a bit of, of uh, some insight, but my reflection on your question, because it's a big one. <laughs> Candice, you had um, written something in the chat. I wondered if you wanted to share it. Um, yeah. Um, well, first of all, the the thoughts that were coming to me um, as you are talking, um, especially um, when your your emphasis on community, Dr. Fernandez, um, really got me to thinking about um, this role of collaboration um, because I think academia has a way of um, telling us that we have to be the one to have the answer or the the one person to pr to present that where the answers I believe and maybe this is a hope maybe this is naivety um, but I believe that just because we right now in this moment do not have the answers does not mean our communities does not have that answer or um, the global communities do not have that answer and so what I put in the chat was um, like these are the the question of like, well, what do we do if we we deconstruct all of this and see its its roots? Like we're having these same conversations in my field in education. And um I, I am also an interdisciplinary scholar. I'm in curriculum studies, which means I can be also, <laughs> Dr. Fred, it is everything and nothing at the same time. Um, but what I offer is that um like if we can get at the the underlying assumptions of this like this stain of difference, which is what I really believe that this is, it's um, just the labeling and um, and forceful renegotiation of people, and and I know my own negotiations between um, white spaces and non-white spaces, and myself as a just in all these different um, these categories. Um, that we hold on to what we just truly want from these um, disciplines, organizations, whatnot, um, then we may be able to find the answers in community. So that's all I wanted to say, but um, to, to put the little cherry on top of the, 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 the cake there. <laughs> so that brings us, I think, to the end of this part of the session, but I invite everyone who can and wants to join us for a more informal discussion with some of the presenters. Not all the presenters can make it, but I think some of them can. There's an opportunity for just a regular Zoom session. I'm gonna put it into the chat and it's important that you uh, copy it now because when we, when we go, 
the chat, the link will go away and the password will go away. So if you want to join this session, please take a moment to copy the, the Zoom link and the password, and we will uh, reconvene in that separate space where everybody can interact and face-to-face uh, -face if they wish in real time. Yeah, Thanks. and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Again, we recorded this session, and we're going to put it on Spissy's YouTube channel. So within the next day or so, um, you can join our channel, um, www.youtube.com backslash Spissy, S-P-S-S-I, and you'll find all of our um, webinar series there. So you can watch any webinar you missed from this entire series. And I also put the link for our next webinar. It's going to be on December 7th at 1600 UTC. So you can register for it there. Or if you didn't catch the link in our chat, I'm going to put the link on our webpage for this series. It's www spissy.org backslash decolonial perspectives. And we'll also put it on our social media. So that's our Facebook page and our Twitter account. Um, so it's just twitter.com backslash spissy and facebook.com backslash spissy. So please register for our final webinar in this series, which will be on December 7th. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. And again, the um, Follow-up information for the chat, for the chat after this is in the chat. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I unfortunately won't be able to join the, the next uh, gathering in just a few minutes, but thank you so much. This was a, a really generative and um, stimulating and inspiring conversation. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you on behalf of um, Shanaz, who has been locked out as well. She thanks the presenters and the audience, and uh, we'll join everyone at the next session.